Welcome back. All right, so I want to talk about Con Smythe. Now, Con Smythe is a figure that gets mentioned here and there. There's been talk about whether or not his name should be removed from the Con Smythe trophy. Uh, circling back to something he said in 1958. So we'll start with that. We'll start with that. We'll start with the controversial side of it, and we'll go through who the man was and this kind of stuff. So 1958, he said he would give $10,000 to anyone who could turn Herb Carnegie, a black hockey player, white. Uh, now, that that quote has been used as a reason that people say his name shouldn't be on a trophy. Shouldn't be there. But there's, there's context that could be there because of societal differences between 1958 and now. There could be his thought that if he brought Herb Carnegie in that he might lose support of other owners that he might lose support of fans, that, like, there were various reasons. Now, I'm not saying that it's not a horrible quote, because it is, but again, the man's not around for us to ask. He passed away in 1980. So that's that's been used, but that's something that, and when we're going through figures from the NHL's past, there's something problematic with almost everybody. And this this is where I will agree with people that it might be best to, to change the names of the trophies, but I'm, I'm not of the mind that that necessarily has to happen. And so we'll talk about Con Smythe because there are good sides with him. There are sides that you could understand why players wouldn't necessarily want to pick up a trophy with his name on it. And the Herb Carnegie quote is one of them. Again, the context could be something that's maybe different than the way it was intended. Came out a little bit odd. Uh, one thing that was said is maybe he just said out loud what other people wouldn't. Maybe it's something people just normally wouldn't have said out loud back in 1958. So he served in both world wars, uh, Canadian, um, and he was uh, higher rank in World War II than in World War I, uh, organized his own regiment. Like, he he had a lot going for him. Uh, pretty highly ranked. Uh, he did complain during World War II about the training that these soldiers were getting, the conscription. Uh, as the war went along, it was harder and harder to find people who were able-bodied and, and capable of doing a good job fighting in the war. And so... Uh, he was he was vocal about it, although there were some who saw that as him politicking, uh, that he, he didn't like the federal government and kind of, you know, using it as a way to needle the, the federal government and get his name out there. What's interesting is during the Second World War, he was already the owner of the Toronto Maple Leafs. So how he gets to that is in 1926, he's hired as general manager and coach of the Rangers. So you'd think, well, how does that make him the owner of the Leafs? Because the Rangers ticked him off uh, be, while he's... he's He's told, put together the team, and then we'll go from there. And while he's putting together the team, and before they've taken to the ice in 1926, he's fired in favor of Lester Patrick. So he wasn't happy about that, obviously. Um, he, you know, still employed by Madison Square Gardens for a bit after, but eventually he would get into Toronto, his hometown, and become uh, Leafs president officially November 19th of 1947, but he'd been an owner of the team since 1927 and making him president in 1947 just confirmed what everybody had known for 20 years. So under his leadership, the Toronto Maple Leafs didn't spend a lot of money on, on salaries. He made a lot of money and his, his prime motivation seemed to be, you know, making money on some level, but he also wanted to win. And this is an argument we've had about Toronto Maple Leafs owners since well, forever, I guess, because it's a conversation that was had about Con Smythe. How important is winning? How important is making the money? And his answer was yes. He wanted to make the money, which means he didn't want the players to, to gain a lot of leverage, and he didn't want to pay them out what they might have been worth based on how many tickets he was selling, and he wanted to make as much money as he could. So, you know, it's, that's, that's how he was. And Toronto was very successful while he was the owner. They won six cups between 1942 and 1951. They won 11 Stanley Cups under his watch of the 13 that the franchise owns. When he took over the team, they were the St. Patrick's, uh, which he had changed to the, to the Maple Leafs. And of course, they'd been the arenas before that. So he, he really did help to shape and mold what the Toronto Maple Leafs became. And they were champs. He was very, very happy to see them winning championships. And he... As much as he liked that, he also didn't like the idea of them forming a union. Uh, Union-busting efforts were there. Uh, he and James Norris, seen as the ones that were the, the ringleaders of the anti-union movement, 
Uh, James Norris. Yep, that James Norris, whose name is on the Norris Trophy given to the best defenseman. So we'll talk about James Norris in the video at a later date as well, because it is interesting to go through the guys who are historical figures in the National Hockey League and have their names on trophies. And you can see why some of them people want to see changed. Con Smythe is one that people have said maybe we should change this. And at the end of this video, you guys can let me know if you think the name should be changed or if you think the name's just fine based on, on the man and on what he did. Uh, so he fought against the unionizing. Uh, and this was in an era where players were getting jobs in the offseason to help supplement their income so they could, you know, keep their house and their car and all that fun stuff, pay their bills. Uh, when the unionizing was going on, he blamed acting captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs Jimmy Thompson, and that was dramatized in the movie Net Worth, and yeah, based on that, uh, Thompson never played another game for the Toronto Maple Leafs. That was the end of his career with Toronto. Uh, so yeah, Con Smythe was not a fan of the idea that you would have um, money going to the players that he didn't want to didn't want to pay him. Uh, he also opposed the Canadian flag that we have today. When the Canadian flag was brought in by Lester Pearson, there were a lot of people who didn't like it. It was very much a not liked symbol. Uh, they didn't they didn't want to use it. He didn't want to fly it at Madison or Madison Square Garden at Maple Leaf Gardens, uh, but he did because most people wanted it. Uh, there was twenty five percent that opposed flying it and seventy five percent in favor. So he said, "All right, majority rule." Uh, if most people want it, then we'll fly the Canadian flag. But he wasn't happy about it uh, because he, he didn't like it. He didn't like Lester Pearson. And so that was that was definitely part of it. And I remember as a kid coming up that I had family members that didn't really like the Canadian flag either. So while it's it's flown everywhere and everybody seems to love it now, yeah, when it was created, not so much. And it may surprise people to know that the Canadian flag was created that recently. Uh, it has not been a symbol of Canada for that long. Uh, now, in March of 1966, he sold his remaining shares in Maple Leaf Gardens. The Silver 7 had been running things anyways. Now, if you've watched uh, the documentary on Harold Ballard that aired on CBC, and I've watched um, I, I've watched the first half hour of it. I watched that last night. But he'd already... The, the Silver 7 was in charge, and they were called the Silver 7 because they were seen as seven guys who were born with silver spoons in their mouths. So that's, that's why they had the name uh, Silver 7. And he was gradually giving power over to, to this, this group of people, including his own son, who he had a contentious relationship with. Um, he, he also opposed expansion in 1967. He went on the record to say, this is a terrible idea, that it's going to water down the product, and we have a perfect league right now, we don't need to expand it. Does any of this sound familiar to people? We hear these arguments. It's funny going through like, you know, stuff from 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 70 years ago and go, yeah, those are the same arguments we have now. Nothing, nothing changes. Uh, but yeah, he opposed the expansion in 1967, uh, was very vocal about that. And of course, as I said, he helped to stop the union's formation for as long as he could. One thing for him was he was very charitable, gave to charity, organized charities, uh, was very willing to give. Now, if you want to be a cynic, you can say, well, that would have been for the tax write-offs. And on some level, yes, there are people who do that for the tax write-offs. But um, in this case, him organizing them and taking such a hands-on role with those charities doesn't have to do that. And the various charities that he gave to and he supported, uh, it, it's, it's a nice part of a story that's not necessarily a great story. Uh, one thing that's interesting is he and Harold Ballard never got along. They didn't like Harold Ballard. Um, now maybe it's that they were very much alike. That does happen, uh, where somebody would, I don't like that person. That's interesting. They're exactly like you. Why wouldn't you like them? Would you like a mirror? And, and I'm not saying that Ballard was the same as Smythe because under Con Smythe, the Leafs had a lot of success and under Ballard, the Leafs really didn't. Now, um, Smythe, as I said, did force out an acting captain of the team because he was looking to unionize and just made him an example for the rest of the team so they would knock it off with the union talk. So that sounds like a Harold Ballard move, right? Because we've we've talked about Ballard, and I've talked about it on the channel before, uh, his relationship with, with Daryl Sittler and, and uh, uh, the, the Lanny McDonald trade and all that fun stuff. So he is a divisive figure, and I get it. You know, I understand why there are those who would like to see his name taken off that trophy, I, I don't know that, that the NHL has any desire to change the name of the trophy at all, um, but we'll see. Uh, the, the, the reality is that 
uh, the the men that were owners, men that are owners, they're owners. They're they're not necessarily there by some virtue of being great people, necessarily nice people. They just have all that money and that capital that gives them the right to own the team. Uh, and in Con Smythe's case, I would say that you know I admire his his efforts in both world wars. I think his his charitable charitable work was good. He knew how to help run a team and and keep them at the top of the league or at least in the running. And he seemed to be able to make the money without being as greedy as Harold Ballard when Ballard uh, shrunk the seats down. And I'm paraphrasing here, but basically he was stating that, uh, Consmite stated that now the seats were were small enough uh, that, that it could only fit skinny men that couldn't afford those tickets. Uh, for the, the larger, rich, older men that could afford those tickets, they couldn't fit in the seats. So that's... That's one thing with Con Smythe that he would have looked at that and said, "No, I'm I'm not doing that," you know. Um, and the large image of the Queen, of course, that was in the building. One of the first things Ballard did was was move that and take that out because she didn't pay for admission. Con Smythe wouldn't have done that. Fought in both World Wars. I I really can't see him doing that either. But let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. As always, don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. And hey, thank you guys so much for watching for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.